Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, let's solve a few problems related to rotational dynamics. Um, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, uh, presented on Unizor.com. I do suggest you to um, watch this lecture from the website because it contains also uh, relatively full uh, notes for each lecture. Um, there are even exams for certain topics. Um, also on this website on unizor.com you can find a math for teens course which is mathematics for um, advanced level of mathematics for high school students which I consider to be a prerequisite for the physics for teens. Okay now um, yeah and the, uh, the site is free by the way for all. Now uh, so let's just talk about these problems. Problem number one Let's assume that we have a wheel on this um, axis. It can freely rotate. Um, it has certain mass, m. But what's interesting is the mass is concentrated only in the rim. So let's consider that the rim is very, very thin but it contains all the mass of, um, of the wheel. Now, if you can imagine, for instance, a bicycle wheel, well, it's not exactly um, like all the mass is concentrated in, in the rim of this, but it's more or less corresponds to reality. These things which connect to the wheel are really very, very light. So we assume that the whole mass is only in the rim. Now, we have a thread and we uh, put this thread around this wheel and hanging on this thread is um, an object of mass m. Now let's assume that the radius of the wheel is r and now after we rotated this thread um, we just uh, let this um, mass go down under the force of gravity and uh, our purpose is to find out what will be the acceleration of um, this mass. Now obviously if there is no wheel there is no inertia of the wheel and this mass just goes down by the force of gravity then obviously its acceleration would be g which is a known uh, free fall acceleration, but this is not a free fall because obviously this uh, mass has certain inertia, certain momentum, uh, momentum of inertia, and it slows down. So the question is how much it slows down. Okay, now um, let's just uh, e examine the details of this. Now, what exactly is the force? Um, which is acting on this mass and on this uh, wheel. Well, obviously, since the mass uh, of the wheel is not zero, uh, there is some kind of a tension here. This is the tension of the thread. Now, this tension of the thread slows down this uh, mass, which means that the total force which acts on this mass is its weight and um, I will consider this T to be um, um, positive for this one and for this one but I will use the negative sign to indicate that actually the tension is um, the real tension vector is uh, directed upwards while the gravity uh, directed downwards, so that's why I put minus t here. So we're talking about magnitudes of these vectors. t is a vector, obviously, and g is also the vector because the g is acceleration which, which goes down. But right now we're uh, considering only magnitude and it's really kind of easy. Now, as a result of this force, this uh, object is going down with certain acceleration which we have to determine. 
So A is acceleration which we have to find out. Okay, fine. Exactly the same um, uh, in magnitude force T tension rotates the um, the wheel. Now we know that there is a concept of torque, right? And this torque is equal on one hand it's equal to the force times the radius because the force is always perpendicular to the radius it's, ten it's tangential to the wheel so my torque is equal to this on another hand we know that the, fork, uh, that the torque is equal to moment of inertia times angular acceleration of the rotating wheel. Well, angular acceleration is actually easy to um, express in terms of A because the acceler linear acceleration of mass M, lowercase m, is exactly the same as linear acceleration uh, of the wheel, obviously, right? Because they're connected with unstretchable and weightless thread. Now, the linear acceleration uh, of the wheel is related to angular acceleration alpha by this formula. So instead of alpha, I can always put A divided by R. Now, what's not obvious what it is, is I, the moment of inertia of the wheel. Now, how can I calculate the moment of inertia of a complex object like this one. Well, the best way is, you have to remember, and we did address, address this issue in one of the lectures before, that the um, moment of inertia is additive. It's like mass. Mass for um, translational movement is additive, and if you have two separate objects of masses m1 and m2 combine them together there will be an object of the mass m1 plus m2 so mass is additive the similar thing is true for moment of inertia and we did demonstrate it in one of the pre previous lectures so i can divide this um, uh, object which is a wheel with the mass concentrated only on the rim I can divide it into many, many different um, small objects uh, and if I know the moment of inertia of each of these objects, I will just add them up together to get the moment of inertia of the entire wheel. Now, obviously, it's an integrating um, uh, problem and in this particular case, if I will divide this wheel into these small objects of infinitesimal um, linear lengths, then each one of them will have an, uh, a mass differential of, of the mass, of an entire mass, right? And I know that it can be considered in this case as a point object of this particular mass, and in which case my um, moment of inertia is this. It's a mass times radius square. If you have a just the point object on the radius r and it's rotating, its moment of inertia is its mass times r square. Now if I will integrate it from uh, 0 to the total mass m, obviously I will get mass times r square. So this is kind of easy approach and it allows you to calculate the um, moment of inertia of a relatively complex um, object. Now, this is probably minimal, minimally complex object because all I have to do is just to add the same momentum um, uh, of inertia uh, infinitely uh, number of times, infinite number of times. Infinitely small one integrated to get an infinite number of these times and obviously I will get this. So this is my i. 
This is a moment of inertia of the wheel. So the entire wheel, if the mass is concentrated only on the rim, basically behaves exactly as a point object of this total mass. And it's kind of intuitively obvious, right? So I will just obviously use it. So in this case, I can put this. So in, if instead of I, I will substitute this, R would, one R is canceling, so I will have mass R and A, right? Now, if you will compare this and this, you will get that the tension is equal to M times A. Fine. Now, obviously, if I know the tension, I can substitute it here, and I will get an equation where my linear acceleration A can be very easily obtained. So mg minus ma equals to lowercase ma. So this goes to there, so I have mg divided by m plus m. That's my A, right? MA goes here, so it's MG divided. Okay, so this is the final answer. So it looks like the force of the gravity is distributed uh, into a combined object of a combined mass to get the, uh, the acceleration. But again, this is a very important property of the wheel where all the mass is concentrated within the rim. So all the pieces, all the small um, uh, object into which we can divide or break this big object, the wheel, they all have exactly the same radius and that's what's very very important in this case. And that's why we have such a simple formula. Now, the next is, the next problem is uh, I would like to calculate the moment of inertia of a little bit more complex um, object. Well, the object which I would like to consider is a disk. So I have a flat disk of um, mass M and radius R and now the mass is distributed evenly within the surface of the disk. So let's consider, let's say, a disk is made of whatever, steel, okay? And it's very, it's thin, but, it's, uh, but, but, but the mass is distributed evenly within the whole surface of, um, of this disk. Now, obviously, you understand that since not all the mass is uh, concentrated on the rim, my total moment of inertia will be smaller. It's not m times r square, as if all mass is concentrated on the rim as in the previous problem. Now, mass is evenly distributed within the whole surface, so many different pieces of uh, this surface into which we can basically break it, they have smaller radius and there and, th and that's why smaller moment of inertia so this is not a total moment of inertia of the disk so what is it again in this case we have to resort to uh, uh, dividing our object into smaller objects for which we know how to calculate the moment of inertia and then add them together because the moment of inertia is additive Okay, so how do we do it? In this case, let me just look at this disk from the top. From the top, it's a circle. Okay? Now, the way how I would like to divide it is the following. I will have concentric um, cuts. So I will have small rings 
of very small widths. Now, if I will divide my total radius into small rings, so let's consider ring at the distance r from a center. And what's the width of this wing? Obviously, not wing, ring, sorry. Uh, the width is differential of r, right? You know how integration is actually working, right? We divide it into many, many different n pieces, if you wish. Uh, each one has the widths r divided by n, and then n goes to infinity, and that's how sum is converted into integral. And again, I assume that all these calculus things you know, and if you don't, please take a look at the Maths 14th uh, prerequisite course uh, using the calculus relatively freely. So, now I have a ring which is very, very thin. This is infinitely thin differential, right? Which means I can consider this ring as the one where all the mass concentrated basically on the same radius. The radius is r. So all I have to know to calculate the um, a moment of inertia of this ring is just have its mass and multiply by the square of the radius. It would be exactly the same as in the previous problem. The previous problem we had a wheel where all the mass was concentrated on the rim and the total moment of inertia was mass times radius square. So this ring is actually like the wheel in the previous problem. It's all mass is on the same distance r from uh, lowercase r from the center and that's why its own mass times r squared that would be its moment of inertia now but what what's the mass well that's very easy i can just have the area of this ring and have basically the ratio of this area to the total area of the disk and that would be the part of the total m which is concentrated within this ring so what's the area of the of the ring in this case well you can just cut it here and stretch it into a rectangle of the uh, lengths 2 pi r and the widths dr right Again, since dr is infinitesimally small um, variable, I can actually consider this to be a rectangle because all these little things which really make it not exactly a rectangle because the inner radius is slightly less than the outer radius, these are infinitesimal variables of the higher order, obviously, than dr. And that's why in integration they would disappear. So this is basically the area. So it's 2 pi r times dr. This is the area. Now, what is the total area of the entire disk? It's pi r squared. So my ratio is 2 pi r dr divided by pi r squared. So this is the ratio of the area of the ring relative to the area of the entire um, disk. So, if I will multiply it by the mass of entire disk, I will have this m. That's what it is. Okay? Great. So, now, um, what do I have as a moment of inertia of this ring? Uh, well, pi will cancel out, so I will have 2 r square uh, r cube pardon me dr uh, divided by r square m right so this is my moment of inertia now i have to integrate it by r from 0 to capital r i have to have sum of all these rings this one this one this one all together they grow up to the radius of the entire disk. And this would be the answer, that would be my moment of inertia um, of the disk. 
So it's equal to, uh, okay, 2m divided by r squared r constants, they go out, and I have integral from 0 to r of r cubed dr, which is equal to <coughs> 2m r squared. Now, um, indefinite integral from the r cube is r r to the force divided by 4 and I have to using the formula of Newton Leibniz to substitute capital R and minus substitution of 0 well 0 will be 0 obviously so it would be 2m r to the force divided by r uh, to the 4 r to the second right what remains in r to the second, which is m r square divided by 2. And this is my moment of inertia of the solid disk. As you see, it's half of uh, the moment of inertia if the total mass is concentrated on the rim only. Okay, that's it. This is the second problem. Now, my third problem is basically a combination of the first and the second. Let me just remind you what was the first problem. The first problem was the wheel and some kind of object here, M, M, okay, this is R. Now, my third problem is exactly the same as the first one, but instead of considering the wheel with all the mass concentrated on the rim, that was my first problem, I will have this solid disk as a wheel. And that's where I will use my second problem. Now, what difference does it make now? Well, it will be almost the same as in the previous problem, so let me just repeat it again. But basically, you would expect that this thing, since it has a smaller um, moment of inertia than if the whole mass is concentrated on the rim, then it will probably make less resistance to this force and force of gravity. And that's why the acceleration would be a little bit greater, right? So let's just make some calculations again. There is a tension here, and on one hand, this tension is the source of resistance to the, to the free fall. So, gravity mg goes down, um, tension goes up, and the difference between, between them is mass times acceleration of the going down of this particular. Now, the T if I will multiply it by, well, in this case I'm using capital R, by capital R is the torque which basically forces the wheel to, uh, to rotate with um, accelerating uh, angular, uh, 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 angular acceleration. And that would be equal to I times alpha, right? Now, I know that I is not the same as it was before. Before it was uh, m r square. Now it would be m r square divided by two. And alpha is um, that's an acceleration, angular acceleration, and it's e e equal to linear acceleration a, which is exactly the same as this one divided by r. So I will have m r a divided by 2. Now from here I can have that t is equal to m a divided by 2, right? This is equal to this. And as you see the tension is half of the tension it was in the first problem. Why? Because the moment of inertia is half as I have calculated in the previous problem, right? So the tension is smaller, 
and that's why resistance is smaller and that's why I will have a greater acceleration. So I will have here um, mg minus ma divided by 2 uh, equals to ma. So my a is equal to mg divided by m plus m divided by 2. So right now I'm having a smaller denominator. It used to be capital M, not capital M divided by 2 in the first problem. So this one is smaller the denominator and that's why the acceleration will be greater. So that's my third problem. Now the third, the, the fourth problem is not related really to um, moment of inertia or torque or something like that which is um, kind of typical for problems in um, rotational dynamics. Instead it's kind of a repetition uh, there will be some forces, but it's more um, about kinetics of the rotational uh, movement. And here is the problem. Um, it, it just might have certain interest because it has um, very easy practical implementation. So let's consider that you are uh, having a thread and it actually makes this type of movement. This is your object on the thread and the object is circulating um, with the same speed. Uh, there are no acceleration of, of, of any uh, kind of... there are no, no, no linear acceleration, let me put it this way. So, um, what's important is that um, do you remember, um, I will probably consider it with, um, with a pendulum, it will be very similar in some way. So the idea of this is that uh, I would like to connect uh, the angle with the horizon, no, I will make it phi, the angle with the horizon um, and um, the speed of rotation um, expressed as angular speed. Now, you probably noticed that if you will just do yourself this type of um, motion with, with, a, with some kind of an object on a thread, the faster you go, the more horizontal the line uh, on which this particular um, object is hanging, the more horizontal it will be, it will be higher. So the faster you go, the higher will go, the, the, this object will, will go, right? So I would like to make calculations, I would like to know how this angle is related to omega. And let's assume that there is a mass m of this object. Now, you will see that actually it doesn't depend on the mass, but in any case. In some way, it's similar to whenever you have a free fall, the different masses are falling down with the same acceleration, right? So it, people thought that the heavier objects would really go faster, but that's not the case, right? Same thing, it, uh, same thing here. It doesn't really depend on the mass, but let's just uh, include it for now into the calculations. So let's just think about what kind of forces are acting on this particular mass. Well, obviously, there is a gravity and also there is a tension on, the, on this thread, right? Thread's the tension. Now, what is this particular force, tension? How, how it's used in this particular case? Well, it has two different uh, components. One component is vertical and another is horizontal. Now, if this angle is phi, 
then the vertical component is t times sine of phi, right? If this angle is phi, then this is t times sine of phi. And the horizontal component is t times cosine of phi. Now, t times sine of phi should be basically large enough to compensate the uh, force of gravity because our object is staying in the same horizontal um, plane it doesn't fall down it doesn't jump up which means these two forces are exactly equal so mg is equal to t sine phi okay now let's talk about horizontal now from the kinematics of rotational movement um, you know and we did talk about this in details that um, if the object rotates then it must be something which keeps this object on the orbit and it doesn't really go tangentially to this um, to a circle to a trajectory now what keeps it there well obviously there is a force um, centripetal force it's called in this case and the result is that it doesn't really flow uh, it, it doesn't fly all the way uh, from the um, circular object this force f forces this object to go back to the center and that's actually the acceleration so we are instead of um, flying off the uh, trajectory we fall back to the circle and um, the acceleration centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared divided by r where v is the um, linear velocity now linear velocity can be expressed as angular velocity and that makes it equal to r omega square so this is the linear acceleration and if the mass is m then m a mass times acceleration should be equal to the force which is actually keeping um, our object on the orbit So this one is one equation, this one is another equation. Now A, we can replace A with R omega square. And now we have two um, unknown omega and t and t here so we can find out what is my omega how omega is expressed um, um, as a function of angle phi and uh, lengths of the uh, length of the thread etc the only thing is which I did not really specify here is radius now the radius of this obviously is equal to uh, length of the thread right times cosine right so r is equal length of the thread times cosine of phi So I can substitute it here and I will have m l cosine phi is equal to n omega square, sorry, n omega square equals to t cosine phi. From this we can find t and substituting this t into this we will get 
the dependency between omega and other parameters which are given. So um, mg is equal to t, which is um, ml omega square, ml omega square times sine phi times sine, sine phi and from here we have mass cancels out as I was saying in the beginning it doesn't depend on the mass so we have basically the dependency between the angle equals to g divided by l omega square um, so dependency between um, angular uh, speed and the angle uh, of the thread which this thread makes with the horizon and obviously the, the bigger uh, the greater the value of omega uh, the smaller will be this part and obviously the smaller will be the sine which means that the smaller angle will be so our thread would be more horizontal and obviously in case my um, omega is equal to infinity which obviously cannot happen only then my sine would be equal to zero and angle will be completely horizontal so basically what it says we cannot achieve really completely horizontal position of this thread no matter how fast we are um, rotating this thread however the uh, the faster we rotate the higher this uh, object will be and the more horizontal will be the uh, the thread okay um, these are all four problems which I would like to talk about today I do suggest you to um, go to this website, to this Physics for, teen, for Teens, and uh, uh, this uh, topic, uh, Rotational Dynamics, um, has these problems, um, among, among other things. And just read it through or try to solve the same problems just by yourself and check if you have the same answers. So it's just a very good exercise and I will also complement this topic with exams for those who want to challenge yourself that's it thanks very much and good luck